Over 11 million original Vegematic sold. They must be good. From London, Ontario, Canada's armpit, it's the Vegematic Deluxe Show for the vegetable in all of us. I'm your host, Vegematic Deluxe. Tonight's special guest, Hambo Littletail. That's not a good idea. Frank, 2732. 55 Ella, 2007 Gay. Bernetzel. A special appearance by Lee Camp. And Margaret Thatcher's Ghost. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to this very special edition of the Vegematic Deluxe Show. Now, I've been watching a lot of these people for a long time and consider them to be good friends of mine. And first up, I'd like to uh, play a little clip by Mr. Vern Etzel, who has now become the chief news correspondent for Armpit News. Congratulations, Vern. The check is in the mail. Please welcome my good friend, Mr. Vern Etzel from Oil City, Pennsylvania. Thanks for showing up to this second episode of Having a Beer with Vern. I promise to edit this significantly. That's cool and all, Vern, but I'm really interested in your views on anarcho-capitalism. So, you know, as much as I'd like to show, you know, models of arguments, um, uh, in reference to not just this stupid topic of anarchism and, you know, is it the true way uh, and in reasonable arguments for, you know, how to outline a new social contract. That isn't, um, uh, you know, utilized by assholes. You know, one of the many underappreciated voices on YouTube is a lady by the name of Ella, and her channel is 55Ella2007K, and I would recommend that if you haven't watched her commentary that you might be the sort of person to enjoy it. Anyway, I'm going to turn things over to Ella, and some opinions on the surveillance society. The security state. What is it that these people are so afraid of? You got me. Okay. So, basically, what we're being forced into is a massive surveillance system, which not even the Soviets or the Stasi could have ever dreamt of. And this is why certain whistleblowers out of their own volition and you have to imagine what this would be like for somebody who puts out this information uh, with incontrovertible evidence that this is taking place what kind of risks these people are taking to their own lives and to the lives of everyone who is connected to them. This is not, you know, this is not Alex Jones bullshit, okay? Alex Jones isn't taking any chances. Alex Jones is basically your average, everyday conspiracy theorist who thinks that the UN is actually some worldwide government, when in actuality, the UN Security Council uh, just look at the makeup of it, okay? So it becomes completely ludicrous for him to even speak out on that issue. Anyway, don't listen to fear mongers because this is really going to ratchet up now. You know, with so much talk of disaffection and revolution, these days, I have to say 
that leaders would be wise to pay attention rather than to go against uh, these movements because uh, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. And I don't want to see any kind of violence. I want to see a peaceful revolution. We've got to overthrow this capitalist, world capitalism, free trade garbage before every single one of us is enslaved. I mean, more, it's drawing closer, claustrophobic, just being human these days, being on the internet and being aware that every move you make is being tracked and stored. Well, just in case one day they decide to mm, eliminate all opposition. It's been known to happen, you know, I don't see why this is any different. It's profoundly undemocratic, this world, worldwide capitalist model, world trade model, profoundly un undemocratic. So why would they not, re you know, use completely undemocratic means to destroy any opposition? Tyrants throughout history have, have proved uh, humanity's capability of mass evil. Absolute power does absolutely corrupt. These ones that claim the moral high ground and yet are, like Jesus said, inside are like whitewashed tombs. On the outside they look good, and the inside they're filled with dead men's bones from drone attacks, no doubt. It must be horrible to have that stuff on your conscience, you know, to make those decisions and then, then realize the, the destruction that you have, your existence has brought about. And not just on a, a, a micro level, but on a macro level. Truly depressing. As far as uh, internet activism goes, I think I'll turn things over to my good friend Frank's from Frank's 2732. Check out his channel. And a few words about changing things, working to change things. Take it away, Frank's. Uh, well, in total, this impact activism, internet activism, uh, there have been claims by some that um, internet activism does not succeed in its purpose, that it is useless or the lone internet activist cannot make a difference or influence um, the political discussion, the everyday political discussion within the community. Well, Supportive documentation for this can be found at the Institute for Politics, Democracy and the Internet and they call an online activist, someone involved in political discussion online, as an online political citizen and the online political citizen is seven times more likely than the average citizen to serve as an opinion leader among their friends, relatives and colleagues. Whereas in normal discourse, only 10% of Americans will qualify as influentials. In their study, they found 69% of online political citizens are influentials. That means they influence the general discussion within having a direct impact every day. So there is yet another clear example of how online activists influence influence the political discussion at the general level. And that influences policy makers in the box. Well, thanks, Frank, for those encouraging words. Now I'd like to turn things over to a fellow from South Austin, Texas, an old hippie friend named Hambone Littletail. And Hambone is my favorite environmental prophet of doom. Uh, just being realistic kind of guy that he is. Anyway, I'll let him fill you in on, uh, on his uh, mission 
of being an environmental prophet of doom. The Doomsday Stoner Blues by Am I Little Pal. Tired of all my money going up in smoke, had to come these 50 greenbacks just to line up one toe. Got the Doomsday Stoner Blues, and it ain't no joke. One more bag of reefer gonna be flat broke. Bernanke's playing Gutenberg, Kurzweil's playing God, city council stealing chickens from the poor man's yard, the zombies glued to Facebook, dream of dancing with the stars, transhumanists are dreaming of hightailing it to Mars. Hey little boy blue, come blow your horn, Exxon's in your meadow, Monsanto's in your corn. The Amazon is burning, the Arctic Ocean's torn, while Mama's popping Xanax and Daddy's watching porn. Planet Eaters digging holes, building bunkers underground, stocking cellars of champagne to toast it coming down. I'm just dodging chemtrails, not knowing where I'm bound, burying silver dollars and praying they're not found. Yellowstone's a bubbling. Fukushima's done blown. Mother ships are hovering on the dark side of the moon. Chicken little squawking asteroids. He's crazy as a loon. Humpty Dumpty's cracked to pieces. Preaching, raging, ruin. The planet's heating up. The Oglala's going down. Save the planet, kill yourself is the message going around. I wish it were that simple. No solution to be found. I'd jump into the river, but it wouldn't help me drown. Apocalypse is coming, gonna smack us in the face. Looks like it's game over for the human rap race. The Beeru's closing in, gonna smack us into space. Smoke them if you got them, guys. We ain't got time to waste. There you go. What that brings back from uh, musician friends, and I'm gonna be back in one minute with my Tuesday sermon. For this one, bye guys. Jobs we're told will come back again and again from red-faced corporate shills trying to be your friends aren't coming back. They're gone for good. They're more gone than Lindsay Lohan's innocence or Ted Nugent's tolerance. People are talking about changes to our comment policy here at Google+. Fuck you, Google! Fuck Google! Fuck you! Fuck you! Today's topic, billionaires. We love them. They're viewed as the pinnacle of success, right? But there's no reason, rationally, we should be okay with or admire the fact that the Koch brothers have $44 billion or that the six heirs of the Walmart fortune have $100 billion. The same amount of wealth as the bottom 40% of America, 125 million people. These people are psychopaths. They're not any more fit for society than the guy who kidnaps neighborhood dogs and has them lick peanut butter off his balls. In fact, they're actually less qualified for society because at least Mr. Nutter Butter's making dogs happy. You know, wandering around on YouTube, I'm always looking for small channels that get very little views, probably because I can relate. And a lot of these channels deserve at least a little bit more attention than they've been getting. And uh, one such case is that's not a good idea. I enjoy his videos and he, he has some good ideas. The U.S. economy is pretty much screwed. <laughs> uh, so let's 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 just go off the three top employers these are the top these are the employers that employ the most Americans uh, number one Walmart one Walmart store costs the taxpayer um, you know thousands and thousands of dollars a year just one store and they're the number one employer number two Yum Brands, which is a giant uh, conglomerate corporation that owns a bunch of other fast food chains, uh, including Taco Bell, uh, Pizza Hut. Um, again, uh, Yum Brands is a, um, a low-wage uh, behemoth um, stretching across the country, or, you know, it's a phrase often used to describe a low-wage job. 
Um, those are the three top employers in the United States. I joined the Libertarian Party through the Clark campaign in late 1979. I also served as state chair of the Delaware Libertarian Party from 1981 to 85. And I ran for national chair at the 1985 Phoenix Convention, where I carried two states. In 1989, I moved to Western Pennsylvania to raise a family, and I served four years as an elected school board director. I rejoined the LP of Pennsylvania in 2009, where I came to serve as secretary for a year, and managed to rally overwhelming support for a new, simplified, and reasonable platform only 10 statements long. I also ran for U.S. Congress in 2010 and received over 3% of the popular vote. However, my platform wasn't the normal Libertarian Party BS you see today. I advocated single-payer medical insurance which I justified from a libertarian perspective. My motto was, we don't need less government, we need better government. You need to understand what Wall Street is up to, really. Why are these cuts even being proposed in the first place? Well, first of all, if you want to do your research on this, you should really, really do your research on the Pete Peterson Foundation to start with. And this is just for starters, okay? I'm not going to be posting any links to this. I might do that later. Uh, but it is a very, very insidious propaganda campaign to start with. And uh, let me just mention three words, okay? Wall Street and taxes. Let's tackle the first two words here, Wall Street. Now, Wall Street desperately wants to get their hands on your Social Security money so that they can manage it. If Wall Street were managing an investment portfolio of the size of the Social Security fund, then, of course, uh, if it is a 1% fee, uh, typically, then they are uh, stand to uh, make 27 billion dollars a year alone. Whether they mismanage it or not makes no difference. Wall Street desperately wants to get that money under their contract and there are basically two ways to do it. Option one is to convince everyone that they will magically be able to grow uh, their money beyond what you might find in the social security system as it stands today. If you happen to be in the position at the age of 65 and your stock portfolio crashes to the ground, then you have nothing to count on. Absolutely nothing. And the big bankers and stockbrokers and, you know, uh, hedge fund managers, you can bet that they will come out ahead and they're not going to care about your little investment portfolio that you had in their social security fund. You're going to be shit out of luck. And, um, you know, the, the current mantra, you know, in mainstream news is, well, you know, we have to cut some benefits in order to make these programs secure for the future. Well, let me tell you something. It's all bullshit. Privatizing social programs uh, and social safety nets is what they're touting, and they're touting it as working. Well, all you have to do is look at Chile under Pinochet, in which these programs were privatized, and it was a complete disaster. And it wasn't just in that country, by the way. So do your own research and, and, and don't listen to these idiots who tell you that Social Security is somehow, somehow a drag on the overall economy. This, is all, this all has to do with overall austerity programs across the globe. This is where this is all headed. It is essentially a race to the bottom for uh, any 
ordinary citizen or working person globally. And we should not be okay with that at all. Option number two is actually more sinister. And this is what is at work here. Basically, you simply have to break the program so that it is unappealing and appears completely dysfunctional to future beneficiaries, that is, the younger generation, by uh, declaring it insolvent in the first place. So Wall Street can make, make it appear not to be working at all. If the cuts are, if these cuts, the proposed cuts that are coming are successful, then no doubt you will hear cries uh, of how the low level benefits provided uh, 10 years from now are not anywhere, they're not keeping anybody out of poverty. Well, of course they won't because the benefits will have been cut so, uh, so much back that they possibly can't. So you see, it is a, it's a very insidious way of breaking a working program and then assuring that Wall Street, in the end, gets their hands on it. One thing corporations need in order to keep hauling in their profits is positive brand recognition. So let's destroy their bullshit brand recognition and distort the natural cognition. For example, Chevron has been toxic dumping in the Amazon rainforest, so let's connect their name to toxic dumping. Example, oh man, I just Chevroned in my pants. Indian food, every time, every time. Monsanto has been sneezing and diseasing over all our food, so let's use that word to mean snot. This guy walked in and he just Monsanto right in my face. It was fucking repulsive. Vegematic 2 also can slice a whole firm unripened tomato in just one stroke. And, uh, you know, it breaks my heart to see all these whack job conspiracy theorists. You know, that who could be uh, attending to what is really going on on this planet. But they don't want to hear this any more than the other 99.99% to 99% of the conspiracy theorists. And I'm talking here, guys, uh, to oversimplify the Alex Jones Kool-Aid drinkers who do understand as Alex does, what is going on in what I call the shallow end of the doomsday prophecy pool, but are completely clueless to, uh, to what is going on in what I call the deep end, which is the imminent environmental ecolog ecological collapse of this planet. And in fact, uh, Alex Jones and a lot of these guys are, are, are fighting, fighting uh, people like me uh, who understand this. They, they in some ways are, are, are more dangerous than the 99.99% the of the clueless morons who will never in their entire lives ever hear the name Rob Hengeveld, much less listen to one word of what the man has to say about what is going on on this planet. You know, people like Rob Hengeveld and Hambone Littletail and Derek Jensen and, uh, and Guy McPherson, uh, we are whack jobs. Google's trying to destroy YouTube. <laughs> and I've been going across watching videos, and uh, in any of the new videos, most of the, most of the comments in the comment sections of these videos has absolutely nothing to do with the video. It's all about how Google's screwing up YouTube. Fuck you, Google! Fuck Google! Fuck you! Fuck you!